Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. If you could change your relationship with food in just 30 days, would you do it? Our guest today is my friend Melissa Hartwig, number one best-selling author and certified sports nutritionist, whose books It Starts With Food and The Whole 30 have shown many people around the globe how to make that crucial change. If you've ever asked yourself, how much can I get away with? This show is for you. Before we get to the interview, here's a great update that just came in from the lovely Ambriel, who Allison and I met this year in Austin. She says, finally broke through the plateau that started back at the end of June. I'm officially 20 pounds from my goal weight, and I'm hoping to reach it by my 44th birthday. Thanks to the tribe and the wild diet, this year has been more awesome than I ever could have imagined. Sending a big thank you to all of the tribe for your support throughout this journey. Congratulations, Ambriel, and thanks to all of the other members of the tribe who have helped get you there. Now you're on the home stretch. And Patty in the Fat Burning Tribe says, I'm 58 and going in for hip replacement surgery tomorrow. Over the past few months, I have gone from 167 to 135, and I feel great. I'm sure this will help with recovery. Patty, we wish you the very best of luck with your surgery. My father actually had a hip replacement last year, and I know that uh, throughout all of that, my mom's actually a holistic nurse practitioner. She's been on the show in the past, and she was having my dad eat super squeaky clean, and it definitely helps with recovery. Be really good to your body when you feed it the right way. It will reward you with improved health. So we wish you the very best, and keep us updated. Uh, and one last one from Monica. She says, wild meatballs approved by my super picky six-year-old who doesn't like tomatoes. Even our two-year-old ate some, LOL. Winning the health war one meatball at a time, Monica. Congrats. That's awesome. But how about you, dear listener? If you'd like to try the wild diet yourself from the device you're listening on right now, check this out. We just updated our online program with the best done-for-you wild meal plans we've ever put together. No ridiculous workouts, calorie counting, or gloom required. Our 30-day wild fat loss program will give you all the tools and support you need to drop the fat with delicious real food. Thousands of fat burners and real foodies from all corners of the globe turned their health around and shed 20, 50, or even more than 100 pounds with a wild diet. And it's taking off. The wild diet won weigh-in after weigh-in on ABC television. You may have seen that. And it's been featured in People magazine and even Entertainment Tonight this year. In the program, you'll get 30 days of fat-burning wild diet meal plans to help get you rapid results. And these are seasonal. We're changing them every month with updated recipes. And it helps you get the freshest food with less food waste to save you time and money in the kitchen. You'll also get the exact recipes we eat at home so you can enjoy chicken parm, chocolate pudding, and even cheesecake, just a little bit here and there, while dropping fat. You'll learn the truth about how much protein you really need, and the answer will surprise you, and tons more. And if you grab it today, you'll even get a limited time discount. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com slash 30 days. That's the number 30, D-A-Y-S. Once again, that's fatburningman.com slash 30 days days and I'll see you there. You can also check out my New York Times best-selling book and audiobook, The Wild Diet, anywhere books are sold. Thanks so much for your support and reviews. And if you've already read The Wild Diet, drop me a line on social media and let me know how you're doing. All right, on this show with Melissa, you're about to learn why you should ask yourself, how much can I get away with? How you can prepare real food even if you've never cooked before, what you need to do to eat healthy in a restaurant, how to make social media a positive force in your life, and much more. Let's go hang out with Melissa. All right, folks, Melissa Hartwig is a certified sports nutritionist and number one New York Times bestselling co-author of The Whole 30, and it starts with food. She's been featured by Dr. Oz, The Today Show, Shape, Outside, and many more. According to Instagram, Melissa is a fan of sushi in Salt Lake City, but not such a huge fan of emojis and pictures of your cat. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is going to be tons of fun, but why don't we start uh, with this one, which might be kind of a humdinger. Whether we realize it or, or not, most of us use food like drugs. We don't mm -hmm. think about food like drugs, though. Uh, and, and Whole30 is such a very interesting way of re-examining our relationship with food. So can you give people, if they aren't familiar with the Whole30, a brief background about what it is and also how you can use it to really change the way you live your life? Yeah, so you can think of the Whole30 like pushing the reset button with your health, 
your habits, and your relationship with food. So for 30 days, you're going to completely eliminate foods that the scientific literature and our clinical experience have shown to be really commonly problematic in one of four areas, your cravings and your relationship with food, your metabolism, your digestion, and your immune system. So you're going to pull all this stuff out for 30 days, and you're going to pay attention to what changes in the absence of these potentially problematic foods. So what happens to your energy, your sleep, your skin, your mood, your bloating, your digestion, aches and pains, any number of medical symptoms or issues, your cravings. At the end of the 30 days, you then bring those foods back into your diet one at a time, really carefully and systematically, Mm -hmm. kind of like a scientific experiment, so that you can evaluate what happens when you bring certain things back in. How does it impact your rockin' energy, your really solid sleep, your non-existent cravings, that ache and pain that like you used to have but Mm -hmm. went away when you eliminated, does it come back? And through this process, you're able to identify and really create the perfect diet for you because there's no one size fits all. What Mm -hmm. works well for you won't work for me and vice versa. So this is a way for you to do this self-experiment and figure out which foods make you less healthy and then make the determination about how much, how often, and when to include those foods back in your life in a way that feels really balanced and really sustainable, but in a way that is always keeping you in touch with your health and fitness goals and like how awesome you want to look and feel. Yeah. And so many people have never really done an elimination diet before so they don't have that relationship with food where they understand that food does have a direct effect on you. I thought one of the most interesting things that happened to me when I started eating really clean was that, and and this happens to so many different people out there, is that you go from feeling meh, whatever, to realizing that oh, no, I, I ate this thing and it trashed me the next day yeah. or in 30 minutes or, or two hours or I completely broke out or, you know, my sleep wasn't as good. What do you find uh, is a surprising thing that a lot of people experience the first time they start eliminating problem foods from their diet? I mean, I think the idea of awareness is huge and awareness is both a blessing and a curse. A lot mm-hmm. of people were like, I think most people come into it thinking, I feel pretty good. Yeah. Right. A lot of people say, like, I feel I feel pretty. I feel good. I sleep pretty good. My energy is pretty good. I'm, right. I'm pretty healthy. And then all of a sudden you strip these foods out and it's like, oh, my goodness, this this thing that I was eating was making my shoulder achy. And right. this thing that I was eating was making my skin break out like you don't necessarily make that connection. And I think once people realize how good they can feel mm-hmm. when you bring that stuff back into your diet and there's any flip from like how awesome you feel at the end of a whole 30, you seriously reevaluate whether that food is worth it or not. Like it's good, but is it so good that I lose how incredible I look, how incredible I feel, the quality of life I have right now, just like feeling in control of my food. And more often than not, the answer is no, it's just not worth it anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, I was going to save this for a later question, but for you, what, what foods are just like, no, I I've -hmm. decided that that doesn't work for me ever again, really, or I don't need Um, it or I don't even like it, you know? It's funny because the further I get in this process, I've done like seven or eight whole thirties. It's been, I did the first one in 2009. So I'm seven years into it. My definition of worth it is always changing. Hmm. So wine is a really good example. Like if you had asked me two years ago, I would have said wine's really good wine that I like is always worth it. No problem. No issue today. I'm really hard pressed to have a glass of wine or definitely more than a glass mm-hmm. because I feel so good and wine just really makes me feel not that great. Yeah. So that's changing. Um, from my very first whole 30 dairy, specifically like goat cheese and soft cheeses, mm-hmm. I will never eat them ever. I don't care if the Pope himself offers me goat cheese. I'm like, no, thank you, your holiness, because they make me feel so terrible. Uh So, and that was not something I was aware of before I did the first program. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what, what was it about goat cheese that you felt or saw or experienced? So for me, and like, everyone's going to be different with this. Some people with dairy, it's like, it makes your allergies act up and you get really Mm -hmm. mucusy and really stuffy for some people it makes your skin break out for some people it creates asthma and breathing issues for me it's all digestive i could go into detail but i will not but (laughs) it's kind of like picture the scene from alien where like the (laughs) thing is bursting out of his about that's basically (laughs) me with a goat cheese (laughs) it's not good (laughs) or meg ryan lactose intolerant after eating all that cheese yeah exactly Uh, (laughs) i love cheese but it's something you have to be very careful with Um, What are some other really common foods that people might think are healthy 
uh, that could be causing problems? Well, whole grains are a really big one, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, whole grains have been touted for their fiber benefits and vitamin and mineral benefits. And, and we're not saying that these foods are good or bad. Right. I'm not saying there's nothing good to be found in these foods. I'm saying they're really commonly problematic in both the scientific literature and across a broad range of people. And I've got hundreds of thousands of experiences now to kind of pull from. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they're good for you. Pull them out and add them back in, I think. You know, grains, particularly gluten grains, are yeah. really closely correlated with everything from like depression and seasonal affective disorder. Dr. Emily Deans writes a lot about psychiatric conditions mm -hmm. and correlation with grain consumption. Obviously, digestive issues, skin issues, inflammatory issues like joints, tendonitis, bursitis. So migraines, like pulling it out and putting it back in is the way for you to figure out if there are some connections between mm -hmm. how you're feeling and what you're eating in ways that you wouldn't necessarily associate with your food. Right. And grains are such a fun one because I've found it, through experimentation that they are fantastically different from one another. Yeah. You know, one uh -huh. grain, uh, for for instance, after eliminating pretty much all grains for for months, uh, not one hundred percent, but mostly, we went to Thailand, and you, you don't really have an option of eliminating, <laughs> you know, yeah. grains when rice is served with literally everything. And so we uh -huh. just, uh, you know, experimented with that for a while. Also knew that some of the other foods there probably had some MSG or other junk in, in the sauces. There's just, it's hard to get around that. But we noticed that didn't do too much to us. But trying to eat wheat again, always just like like a punch in the face. We'll, mm -hmm. uh, it'll either be digestive or we'll start breaking out or, or something will happen. Similar thing with beer. Um, I can drink certain wines and, and they're okay. Not most wines, but some are okay. But beer, I've, I've tried adding it back in a bunch of times and it tastes great. It's wonderful. But then all sorts of little things start happening again, those aches and pains that you were talking about. And man, it, once you get used to living without that stuff, it's mm -hmm. you, you find that it's really not worth it. What are some really other surprises isn't. for people who have, who have uh, you know, made it through their whole 30? I think identifying what some of your, I call them gateway foods are, has been a real shocker for some people. So, you know, in the absence during the elimination period, you're not only eliminating foods according to the technicalities of the rules, don't mm -hmm. eat this ingredient, don't eat this. We have some structure built into the Whole30 that basically addresses people's emotional relationship with food. So, for example, you're not allowed to consume recreations of junk food or mm -hmm. treats or sweets made with technically approved ingredients, meaning you can't figure out how to make a Whole30 pancake or Whole30 yeah. ice cream or Whole30 brownies, right? Because that's not going to facilitate you changing your habits or your relationship with food. And I think people coming off the program are really surprised at how much those foods were sort of this like slippery slide into feeling totally out of control with your right. food again. Right. So that's a huge wake-up call for a lot of people. It's like, oh, I used to eat pancakes all the time. Now, you know, I eat pancakes for breakfast, and they're gluten-free pancakes, and I'm using fresh fruit on top, but all of a sudden for the rest of the day, all I want to do is eat all the sugar. Right. So identifying that association is huge, too. The food may not be having an immediate impact physiologically, but if it's making you crave more, if it's making you feel less in control of your food, if it's making you feel like if you've got this guilt or shame association when you eat this food because you're not totally in control while you're consuming it, like mm -hmm. those are all really important things to pay attention to too. And it's pretty easy to get thrown out of control for most of us without realizing it, right? What would mm -hmm. be an example of someone who, uh, who, who might not realize that they have an issue with food, but it is starting to control them? So I think a lot of people, when you think about the idea of like sugar addiction or, you know, the people who are like seriously, dis they self-describe as I'm food addicted or sugar addicted, mm -hmm. that's sort of one category of food. And those people, I think, all realize that they are just totally out of control with their food. But a lot of people will look at that and say, well, I'm not that bad. Like I eat a little chocolate here and there. I do a little bit of this here and there, but like, I'm not like that. Yeah. And I think, again, when you take this stuff away it helps people realize, as it did for me during my Whole30, how much I'm using food as reward, mm. as comfort, to mm -hmm. self-soothe, as a proxy for love. So I think that is really surprising to a lot of people is like, you may not be feeling out of control like you can stop after eating half a chocolate bar. You don't have to eat the whole thing. Or if someone says, oh, no, there's none of that left, you're not going to like pitch a fit and run to 7-Eleven at 11 o'clock at night to get a candy mm. bar. But 
are you automatically reaching for these foods when you're in pain, when you're sad, when you're lonely, when you're anxious, when you're bored, yeah. right? That is, in a sense, being out of control and or not having alternate coping mechanisms. But nature abhors a vacuum, right? And so mm-hmm. if you if you all of a sudden take all these things that people are, are using as crutches away, where does that leave them? How do you help them focus yeah. on, on really improving themselves and moving forward? So this is where the no recreating sweets and treats comes in because mm-hmm. if you take away people's cookies, they're want, gonna wanna replace it with other cookies. And we focus so much, like habit willpower and the psychology of change is a huge area of research for me. So what yeah. we do during the program and the support that we offer is we remind people that it's not just about the technicalities of the rules, it's about changing your habits big picture. So if you have dessert every single night and then you go on the whole 30 and every night after dinner you're having a big bowl with strawberries and coconut milk and toasted coconut and cacao chips, Mm -hmm. technically whole 30 compliant, actually a really healthy choice, but you're still feeding that habit of dessert. So what we encourage people to do is take a look at that behavior and say, what are you looking for in this scenario? What's the reward? Do you want a little you time? Do you want a little comfort? Are you feeling anxious? And what else can you do? And we give people a ton of examples. What else can you do in that moment to satisfy that need without reaching for any food whatsoever? Yeah. You know, I, for the most part, I think what works with my personality is kind of taking that big focus on one part of my life and just doubling down on it. And that's what you're doing when you do a Whole30. You're mm-hmm. making food a focus and priority in your life. And I think for most people, while you can definitely get results with a more relaxed approach and just kind of trying to clean things up over time, what you're missing out on is that that difference in feeling that you have when you wake up in the morning. And you can really make these these linkages between or correlations, I, I, I guess I should say, between certain things that are improving in your life and what you're doing from a food perspective. So what's one way, if, if people think that they can't do it, right, That and they're used to just kind of doing a more relaxed approach to food, how do you get them on board to really say, this is worth it, let's do this? So this is a really loaded question because according to the stages of change, if someone is not in, if someone is still in the pre-contemplation phase where like they're not willing to admit that there's an issue and that something needs to change, there's literally nothing you can do. Sure. So barring that, assuming that somebody is, you know, in that they're contemplating, they're, they're preparing, they're thinking about it. What you'll hear a lot are, it sounds like a logical argument. They'll say, oh, I don't have time to do all this prepping and cooking, Mm -hmm. or I wouldn't know what to do at the grocery store, or I travel too much, I don't know what to do while I travel. It sounds like a logical argument, and what most people will do is try to fix that problem, right? Okay, oh, well, there's this great meal planning service that I'll sign you up for that takes care of meal planning, or oh, there's this awesome shopping list, I'll go grocery shopping with you. Yeah. The problem is that you can't win an emotional argument with logic. And almost Mm -hmm. all the time when people come up with these like, I can't do it because, they're really saying, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. It gives me anxiety. Um, I'm not sure how, like there's something, there's some emotional reason behind it. So you're not going to be able to assuage their concerns with logic. This is where you need to say like, what about this kind of freaks you out? What do you think is going to be the hardest part of this program? How can I support you through this difficult, you know, this difficult transition? Um, what have you done in the past that hasn't worked? And, and why do you think that this is going to be maybe something different for you? So yeah. addressing some of their emotional concerns can really go a long way towards tipping the balance of getting them feeling comfortable to be on board. And then at the end of a whole 30, everything is 100% amazing, right? Rainbows and butterflies and your life is figured out. Not exactly. How do, you, yeah. how do you live the rest of your life? Seriously, though, when you uh, you said that this is something you've been doing for seven years, your definitions are always changing about what works for you. How do you make this a lifelong journey? Because I think too many people, you know, it's January. I'm doing this. And then two weeks later, of course, it's it's gone. How do you make this yeah. a lifelong process for people? So that is exactly what my next book is about. So Food Freedom Forever comes out October 4th of this year. And it's all about how to take any short-term dietary intervention, whether it's the Whole30 or a self-designed vegan reset or gluten-free, whatever your kind of short-term intervention is, how to take what you've learned during that process and turn it into a lifetime of healthy habits because that's the money. You can do anything for 30 days. Anybody can follow a set of rules and, you know, either white-knuckle your way through it or really throw yourself into it and embrace it and do well. But 
life happens, vacations happen, stress happens, holidays happen, and eventually you will find yourself back in old habits because there's no 30-day intervention that's going to replace decades of associations and relationships and habits with food. So what I want to tell people is that it's expected that you're going to fall back into old habits, and it's totally okay, and it doesn't mean that you're a failure. Here is a three-step plan for kind of getting you back on track and working through this cycle in a way that keeps you kind of staying in balance for longer and longer the more experience you have with the program. Yeah, and you don't want to get trapped into feeling like a guru, right, where you do have it figured out, where you're locked into a position saying, these foods are good, these foods are bad, I'm set now. It's never like that, right? It's never like that. The foods aren't good or bad. They're always unknown, mm-hmm. period. And even when you think you know, like I like I said, my definition of worth it is always changing. I'm yeah. still playing around with food. You know, the other day, for the first time in a really long time, I had some cheese. Yeah. It didn't go well. But yeah. I'm still playing around with it because right. my gut is healthier, my immune system's healthier, and like I've had experiences where I've been able to reintroduce stuff and it actually goes really well. And I'm like, yeah. cool, now my diet is expanded. So right. yeah, you're it's you're all it's like a lifelong process and people just have to buy into the idea that like you're always playing around with it, you're always experimenting. But it, it can also be really fun. It doesn't have to be this stressful, weird like relationship. It can be really fun. How do you make it fun? Especially if you are making such a big change. Yeah. Um, You know, in terms of like keeping it a lifestyle, the way I like to describe it is that my goal is to have the broadest diet possible Mm -hmm. while still feeling as awesome as I want to feel and looking as good as I want to look. And so for me, finding that line is really fun. Can I get away with a second glass of wine? Actually, yes, I can. Awesome. Can I get away with a glass of wine and a cupcake? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Can I get away with a glass of wine, a cupcake, and a piece of cheese? Nope. Yeah. All right. Well, that's my line, right? <laughs> so I'm always playing around with it. I'm always experimenting. I'm bringing yeah. foods back in that I haven't tried in a while. I'm trying new recipes. I'm doing things in combination. Like I'm always learning in with the goal of how much can I get away with and mm-hmm. still feel fantastic. Yeah. And like that's a really fun process. It is a fun process. It's fun and painful, but that, that pain is a teacher, right? Uh, if you want to get all philosophical yeah. about it, you kind of have to find those edges to understand where they are, then make your way back to the sweet spot. And that's where you can kind of live. And then every once in a while, just you know, go outside again and, and, and see what might work for you. But be honest with yourself when it doesn't. And one of the things that happens, you know, uh, of course, as you age is you might not be able to get away with the things that you used to be able to get away with. But instead of saying, I still can, or there's no way I'll ever get fat or, or something like that, or I'm not that fat, you know, whatever that story you're telling yourself is, it's important to always recognize that this is a process and we're all mm-hmm. deeply human and quite flawed. And it's best to find out what those flaws are. I mean, one of the things I'm really excited about is genetic testing and looking at how different nutrients really affect you in a unique way compared to someone else. I think that's where all this is going, and anyone who says they have it figured out will be very shortly proven wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so much we don't know in terms of the science, and there's so much we don't know in terms of the way food interacts synergistically in the body. And then, like you said, my context is always changing. Mm-hmm. My environment, my stress levels, my sleep, my physical, my training, my muscle mass, my fat mass, like all of that is always in flux. So you know, what happens is that people, I tend to find a sweet spot and I can hang out there for three or four months and like Mm -hmm. everything's clicking. And then all of a sudden the wheels start falling off the bus because things have changed. Right. So I just react and I figure out what needs to change. Do I need to change my training? Do I need to train more, train less? Do I need to eat more, eat less, whatever that looks like? Yeah. Yeah. So considering how fit you are and you are very fit, you know so much about it. Um, one area where I get a lot of questions where I'm not necessarily prepared to answer is what do you do as a fit woman to make sure you're fueling correctly and also not damaging your hormones, especially if you are more physically active or or kind of like on the athletic spectrum of things? So I'm really aware of probably because I've messed this up so much in the past and I've put myself, I've dug a hole for myself in terms of hormonal balance and adrenals in the past with overtraining, under eating, over stress. I'm really at this point, super aware of like what my body likes, what I do well with, what I don't do well with. So I understand my context right now is such that, you know, I've been working on two books at once. I'm a halftime single mom. I'm running this business. 
I don't have capacity to do high intensity, a lot of high intensity training. Mm -hmm. So I don't, right? I just don't do it. I do a lot of heavy stuff. I do a lot of body weight stuff. I do a lot of long, slow distance hiking out in the mountains. Um, Your Instagram is great, by the way. Oh, thanks. (laughs) I do post a lot of fitnessy stuff, right? I do a lot of yoga. So I am training right now based on my context and I'm way more gentle with like my body than I've ever been it used to be that I would just like beat myself into the ground because Mm -hmm. I could and because I felt like that was progress and now it's like if I wake up and I don't feel like going to the gym I'll go for a walk or I'll go to a yoga class or I won't do anything and that's totally okay too so I think if you people really need to pay attention to context like it's great that my next door neighbor who's my age and my kind of body type and has my family situation can go to the CrossFit gym two days a week but like her life is not mine yeah so I need to just kind of keep my context in in my head and figure out what I can do to keep myself healthy. Cause if I'm not healthy, I'm no good to anyone right. like you, my readers, my peers, my son, my family, my friends, like my top priority is making sure that I'm healthy. Yeah. Boy, is that a tough pill to swallow, especially as someone in the, in the health field of writing books, we were uh, talking about this before the interview, how writing a book is, is basically the worst thing you could ever do for your health. But <laughs> Melissa begs to differ now that she's, you're on your third book. Is that right? I just finished my third book, yeah. And you're being healthy at the same time. Tell us how you did it. I came out, I escaped this third book just as healthy, if not healthier, like fitter, yeah. well-rested, energized, as I did going into it, which is the first time I can say that. The first two books, like not a chance. The first book <laughs> yeah. basically killed me. Right. And there's, there is such irony in writing a book about health and fitness and then digging yourself into the ground, like wrecking yeah. yourself in the process. But I knew going into it that some things would have to change in order for me to maintain my top priorities. So I focused on sleep and exercise and um, really super healthy eating. Those were the three things that I got at all times, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And what I had to sacrifice in the process was socialization with family and friends, basically. Mm -hmm. So there were long stretches of time where like I only went out once a week. I only saw people once uh, very sporadically. I would keep in touch via text or via phone call, but like I had to turn down a lot of social opportunities so I could go to bed early so I could get up in the morning and train. But because I prioritized that way, I was able to focus on all my work stuff and get my book done and turn it in on time, um, maintain my, a great relationship with my son and my family when they were in town and keep myself super fit and healthy. Like, I don't feel like I lost any health whatsoever writing this book, which is, it only took like four years for me to figure out how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the beauty of experience, right? Because when you first write a book or you first try to get in shape or revamp your diet, you don't really know what you're doing. You don't know what to expect. You don't know how long it'll take. You don't know if it'll work at all. And a lot of times you don't yeah. think it will, right? You you, yeah. you are you have this disconnect between where you think, you know, of course it could work for other people, but I don't think it'll work for me. There's something different yeah. about me where it won't. But then over the course of time, you start to learn that there are things. This is a process. We can do this and we can make it happen. And that's the good news for everyone out there, whether you're writing a book or not. This does get, I don't want to say easier, but it gets simpler more straightforward yeah. you can yeah. you can get one step ahead of it right because you know what it takes to sleep well to eat well to exercise you know what works well for your body you don't have to think about it anymore you don't have to wonder what you're doing you just have to kind of wake up and do it or go to sleep because you know that's the time to go to sleep um mm-hmm. what what is it that that you see that separates the people who truly succeed for a lifetime i mean from those who kind of fall off the wagon Oh, that's a big question. I think some, I think a lot of it has to do with the way you're thinking about your effort. If we're talking specifically just about like nutrition and healthy eating, Mm -hmm. the way you're thinking about this process, I think is really important. So if you're thinking about it in terms of I'm going on a diet, I'm going off a diet, I'm moderating, like these are all buzzwords that have really negative connotations that have been very, very hard to maintain. And of course, when you go on a diet and off a diet, like you know, cravings reappear, you feel like you have the, you know, you deserve a reward or a treat. Mm -hmm. And then when you fall back into old habits, you feel like a failure and you have to come back to it. Thinking about it, and I, I, the word that just keeps coming to mind is grace, like just giving yourself a little more grace, Mm -hmm. that it's a process, that there will be ups and downs, that it's a cycle, that you're going to do really, really well and then fall back into old habits, but here's how you're going to get yourself back to a place where you're feeling good again. Um, Just changing the way you're thinking about this effort, as you just said, that it's just this lifelong 
process, a cycle and its progress and not perfection, I think can go a long way. I also really love the idea of people adopting a growth mindset. We mm-hmm. talked about this on our panel at Paleo FX, yeah. this idea that characteristics or traits about yourself are not fixed. That just because as a kid someone told you you weren't athletic doesn't mean you can't develop the skills to become athletic. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with being healthy. Embodying this idea that I am a healthy person, living a healthy lifestyle, I think makes a huge difference in how people see themselves and how motivated they are to pursue other healthy efforts in their life. (laughs) One thing I read uh, from my friend Brian Grass, I was reading his book the other day, and he he said, you know, at a very meta level, you are, as a human 16 trillion electrons. <laughs> I'm like, right? okay, yeah, you really could be anything. That's a good way to think about it. <laughs> right, yeah, it's really, really true. And I think getting something like your food, getting feeling in control of your food for the first time in what may be decades for a lot of people, it changes everything, your mm-hmm. self-efficacy, your self-confidence, and like that spills into every other area of your life where it's really natural for people to say, well, now what can I do? I wonder if I could start exercising. I wonder if I could meditate. I want to take that college class. I want to reduce my stress levels. So I think it's just such a good and powerful place to start. It's food. Yeah. That's where all this started. That's that's why I'm here right now. I've been doing this for Mm -hmm. five years on this show with the blog and everything else. I... Uh, I cleaned up my diet, learned a few things about science and physiology and the way the body works. And I was like, this is so powerful. There's no way I can do anything else anymore. This yeah. this is what it has to be. And, and I love seeing other people go through that experience, right, where they get their diet and nutrition and, and thus their health under control for the, probably the first time in their life. And then mm-hmm. they're like, look at all the other things I can do, right? They yeah. start to yeah. make serious changes to yeah. their lives and devote their time to something completely different, change careers, start a family, whatever it is, it is a powerful, powerful thing. What have you seen from people in your community? Oh, everything. I mean, it's so, hearing the stories, it's so cool that people are like, my relationships have changed. Mm -hmm. I'm a better wife. I'm a better mother. I'm a better family member. Like I've improved my communications. We spend more time in the kitchen together. We spend more time outside together. So seeing relationships change is amazing. Seeing people who make career changes that you've talked about. I've I've spoken with people who are like, I ditched my crappy corporate job and now I'm becoming a health coach or I'm becoming a nutritionist or I'm pursuing a personal training certification because this Mm -hmm. is my love and this is my passion. That's amazing. I just hearing people talk about their self-confidence changing, that they used to be shy and meek and didn't want to socialize with other people and just felt like they, their self-worth was kind of in the tank. And then Mm -hmm coming alive just because they changed the food they put on their plate. It's just, there's no, I I firmly believe there's no area of your life that it won't influence in a really positive way. Yeah. Now, how about this? When you're eating something that's, that's really squeaky clean, you're doing that for the first time in your life. It's not easy. It, It takes effort and willpower, right? It's, it takes some sort of mental energy. But there's something about that, and I don't want to say moderation, but it, it's something about like uh, discipline, right, that you're training yourself. Mm. And when you come out of it, it's like that little bit of struggle or that little bit of making it hard on yourself is enough to make everything else that much easier, right? And yeah. I, this is a long-winded, long-winded way of getting at, at this. But do you know what I'm talking about there where when you do have that sense of control and you practice it, you know it's good for you and you do it every day with every meal, all of a sudden you can bring that to anywhere else in your life and, and all of a sudden be a much better person in your relationship or, or a much mm-hmm. better mother or, or father. It teaches you something, right? It does so much. So the most famous line of the Whole30 Rules, and this line's been in there since 2009. I wrote it in April 2009. This is not hard, right? Beating cancer is hard. Quitting heroin is hard. Mm-hmm. Birthing a baby is hard. Drinking your coffee black for 30 days is not hard. And it's it's a little bit of cheeky tough love because that's my yeah. voice, but it's also meant to empower people. And there is something about taking on something as challenging as the Whole30 or short-term di- any short-term dietary intervention and knowing going into it that there are going to be major challenges and it's mm-hmm. going to be tough and it's going to be emotional. It's going to be like an emotional experience and then seeing it through. The, the sense of self-confidence and power that comes from that experience, as you said, that experience in and of itself is so incredibly valuable. Sure, you mm-hmm. get all these benefits from eating healthier, and that's amazing. But doing something that you know is going to be hard and then actually seeing it through 100%, I feel like there's you feel like you're on top of the world. You're unstoppable. Yeah. And, well, then you earned it. You yeah. earned it. You can feel good yeah. about that. Yeah. 
and exactly. use it to really propel you forward. Now, uh, before we run out of time, I did want to ask you, one, one of the biggest things that uh, that we get a lot of when we try to get people to eat real food at the beginning is, I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to get this food in front of me or, or eat it or whatever. They, they might have never cooked before in their lives. How do you take people mm-hmm. who are really true beginners in the kitchen and, and get real fruit, real food in front of them? Yeah, so part of it is just having a ton of resources. We've got a ton of free resources going all the way back to like assuming that people have never cooked or or don't know how to cook and don't really even know about real food and what Mm -hmm. to buy and what this strange looking root vegetable is. Shopping lists, pantry stocking guides. The Whole30 book has an entire section in the middle called Kitchen Fundamentals, which is how to hard boil an egg, how to grill a chicken breast, how to bake some salmon, because I think the message needs to be real food doesn't have to be super fancy, crazy recipes, Mm -hmm. tons of spices, really advanced. I call them ingredient meals. You take really healthy ingredients, you cook them in ways that are pleasing, you put them on a plate. My meals on Instagram are probably the most boring meals of any like paleo, you know, expert out there. Sure. But this is how I eat. Yeah. I will grill a chicken breast. I'll throw some Tessie Mae's hot sauce on top. I'm going to roast some sweet potatoes and cauliflower, and I'm going to, like, throw it on a plate, and that's my dinner. And it's delicious and satisfying, but, like, it doesn't have to be complicated. Mm-hmm. What about eating out, though? Practice. Yeah. I can. You can take me to any, literally any restaurant, and I will find something totally fine to eat. It may not be exactly what I want. And it may not be the most interesting meal, but it just takes some practice. And the more yeah. you practice, the more confident you are. You know, the vegetarian going into a meal doesn't feel funny saying to the waiter, hey, I'm a vegetarian, which meals are appropriate? Right. It's the same for me when I go in and I say, hey, I don't, I don't eat any gluten or dairy. Is there anything hidden in this order that I'm not seeing? Yeah. It's not hard. Be really matter of fact, smile a lot, be really polite, ask for what you want, be gracious if they don't get it right, and tip really, really well. And the more you practice, the easier it gets. And I'll tell you what, when when we first started, it was the uh, wait staff tended to be a lot snarkier than they are now, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. It was not very cool uh, back before, I, th- I think, like 2010-ish, to be healthy or to eat healthy yeah. in public or to eat vegetables in general. And now it's so great because I think it is, you know, it's not easy everywhere, but for the most part, you're not going to be the first one asking for your meal gluten-free or dairy-free or wheat-free or, or grain-free, whatever it, it tends to be no. without meat, anything. They've heard it before at this point, and they're yeah. catching on that the, the way they're going to grow is by uh, nourishing the health nuts, really. And if, if people yeah. are asking for food that's that specific, yes, they might be picky eaters, but that's because they've found out that it's worth it at this yeah. point. Yeah. You know? When I was, in, I was camping, I was doing some hiking up in Banff a couple of weeks ago and was at this restaurant and the dish that looked amazing was this shrimp and a ton of different vegetables on pasta. So I was sitting at the bar and I just said to the waiter, like, hey, I would love this dish, but I don't do any pasta. Can you just throw it on some steamed spinach instead? And he was like, we've never done that before. And I was like, I know, I'm just curious if you could. And he's like, I think so. So he went back and he was like, yeah, we can do that for you. And the whole restaurant got really excited at this like yeah. new preparation. And when the dish came out, everyone at the bar was like, wow, that looks really good. And I'm like, I know. And it was <laughs> delicious. So, you know, be creative, be really polite about it. And then yeah. if something, you know, I think the more you do that, the more the restaurants understand that like, hey, this is actually in demand. And like the people who are ordering this are actually really nice and really cool about it, too. Yeah. Now, what do you tell people when they say this is too expensive? Real food, fresh food is too expensive for me. I mean, it depends on who's saying that, right? If it's like a single mom working two jobs in a food desert, yeah, she's got an argument. If it's somebody who's Snapchatting this question to me and I know you have an iPhone, I'm going <laughs> to say it's a matter of priority, right? So yeah. It is more expensive than eating at McDonald's every day. There's no two ways around it. But there's nothing I wouldn't give up in terms of my life and and the luxuries I have to be able to put really good food in my body. And I think that that's something that just kind of comes with time. The healthier you eat, Mm -hmm. the better you feel, the more willing you are to spend money on things like grass-fed and organic or specialty items like ghee. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there are also, though, some real good cost-cutting measures that you can implement so that it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. You know, frozen vegetables frozen seafood like not everything has to be organic yeah. um and 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 local go to your farmer's market get a csa make your own ghee or clarified butter instead of buying it in the jar like there are a mm-hmm. lot of things you can do to make it more affordable but i think um 
I think for most people, it's really just a priority issue. And yeah. if it becomes a priority, then it will. Yeah. You can make it happen. You can also find a way to save a ton of money eating yeah. real food, too. There are so many ways. That you mentioned some of them, but there are so many ways to do it. And yeah. I think you're, you're totally right. It's all about priorities. But uh, before we go, I do want to hit on this. Uh, you do such a wonderful job with, with Whole30, with social media, uh, mm, using okay. technology as a force for good as opposed to a force for something that distracts us and, and pulls our slow soul away and distracts us with Pokemon Go and that sort of thing. You're, you're really using it to build community and improve people's lives. Do you have any tips for how other people can be as well for themselves a force for good on social media as opposed to what it normally turns into? Yeah, um, I think the tone, you know, it comes from the top down, right? We've always been really consistent with our voice and with our message and we're not we really try to walk our talk. So we're not a weight loss program, so you're not going to see any bikini picture before and afters or here's how much weight I lost on the whole 30 feed. We're really careful about monitoring comments, and we don't delete or censor, but if somebody kind of approaches something from a negative perspective, we posted a testimonial once, and somebody was like, you know, that, that looks like it's fake. There's no way she could do that before and after. And it was like if you either be supportive or don't say anything at all. So we're yeah. really careful about making sure – I think from a personal perspective, like I unfollow people who don't lift me up. If I find myself comparing, if I find myself feeling like worse about my life for having mm -hmm. followed this person in my feed, I just don't follow them. Yeah. I invite that. Yeah. So I think the unfollow button is super powerful. I think it can be really easy to get overwhelmed with all of the different messages coming your way, like this paralysis by sure. analysis. Yeah. So I just pick a handful of people that I really like and I trust and their messages are really consistently what I need to hear. And those are the people I listen to. And I'm not searching for hours and hours, you know, listening to what 700 different people have to say about health or fitness. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some ways that you can. And then I really try only to contribute in social media in a really positive way. If I don't have anything nice to say, I don't say anything at all. I yeah. don't react defensively. I'm not like, you know, calling people out. I accept criticism what I hope is gracefully and respond to it. And then I really stay like engaged authentically with my community. And you have this wonderful balance between true professional who knows her stuff and complete goofball. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You know, people don't want to connect with a brand. They want to connect yeah. with you. They don't want to connect with fat burning man. They want to know you. They want right. to know a little bit about who you are and what makes you tick and what you like. So I share things on my social media feed that are personal, but not intimate. Right. So I've drawn this boundary. You won't see pictures of my kid. You won't hear anything about my dating life, but I'm happy to share with you my hikes and my struggles and my challenges and my gym experience and what I'm eating and like all that stuff. I want people to get to know me and I want to do it in a way that hopefully comes across as authentic because you just kind of, what you see is what you get on social with me. Yeah. Well, what you do is inspiring millions in so many different ways. Melissa, thank you so much. Before we go, Thanks. why don't you tell folks where they can find you and what you're working on next? Yeah, so everything to find Whole30, it's just at Whole30 on every social media feed. So the W-H-O-L-E and the number three zero. And then I'm really active on Snapchat and Instagram. You can find me at Melissa underscore Hartwig on Instagram. And my snap is linked there. Um, Food Freedom Forever comes out October 4th. That's the next big thing we're working on. So September Whole30, big group site-wide Whole30. And then a two-week book tour for Food Freedom when that launches on the 4th. Awesome, awesome. And we'll have to do a hike one of these days. <laughs> I would love that. Come to Salt Lake City. It's amazing here. Oh, I love that place. Yeah, we'll have to do yeah. it. Okay, Melissa, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'd love to have you on again soon. Sounds great. Thank you so much. This was really fun. Before you go, don't forget to grab your listener discount on our 30-day fat loss plan. In this plan, we share 30 days of mouth-watering wild diet meal plans that are designed to help you drop fat with real food. The meal plans are paleo friendly, easy to make, and literally the meals that my wife Allison and I eat just about every day and night to stay lean, fit, and happy. In the program, you'll get the most effective method of meal and nutrient timing to best stimulate fat loss and muscle recovery, the truth about how much protein you really need for your body type, 30 days of specific healthy fat burning meal plans as a done for you nutrition strategy, and tons more. If you check it out today, you'll even get a listener discount. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com forward slash 30 days. That's the number 30, D-A-Y-S. Once again, that's fatburningman.com forward slash 30 days. I'll see you there. 
Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you. And if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or FatBurningMan. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes in video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. So it's really written to be able to work with your conventional doctor. And it goes through and explains exactly what labs to get. And of course, I can go over those, what the optimal reference ranges are, because that's a big problem of why 60% of these people are not getting diagnosed.